Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 956. I am Stephen in Edmonton. Born in Vancouver. And Derek in Dallas. Derek in Dallas, which Yay. feels, when you say it that way, sounds sounds slightly rude, but... Uh, because, uh, <laughs> does, that's because you're thinking of Debbie I Does. Just, I was the, thinking uh, of Debbie film. Does, and yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. like, I never really heard the alliteration before, so... Yeah, uh, anyway, that's, Derek, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that, so, came out right maybe now. you're yeah maybe change it to I don't that's, know that's that's the one or, one time in ten years worse. that I think of that movie title <laughs> long forgotten to time yeah I know uh, Derek and Fort Worth Derek and Arl I'm only naming suburbs of of uh, sports teams where they play I, I am so. actually in Dallas that's the thing because I know I know uh, Kyle last week was was very precise about where he was but I am that, I am actually in Dallas so proper Dallas all right <laughs> yeah. well it it's good to have you aboard Chris is still gallivanting in the UK um Derek has been on our show a couple times in the past to talk about uh uh first about um ratings with Tom Spilsbury way back when and then uh in an appearance that I have completely forgot about apparently Derek <laughs> shortly after the announcement of Disney Plus uh being the new home of Doctor Who I, I talked to you about that too and I don't remember it at all <laughs> <laughs> was it good? Was it a good chat? Did we have a good time? Yeah, it was, was a good chat. Yeah. yeah, we were just like, how did this happen? What's going on? Right. And yeah, trying to wrap our yeah. heads around it. Yeah, well, that was the early days of that. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on here because now that uh, now that there's very much a, a, a streaming first uh, approach to Doctor Who for the first time in its existence, I think it'll be very interesting to get mm-hmm. a an actual learned professor's um, opinion on our this amateur hour nonsense. Yeah. Um, but uh, but hey, but and also later on, Chris will be on this uh, as, we, as we do what part three of our Terror of the Autons commentary. I've kind of lost track of where we where we are in that. We're trying to sort of get that out of the way before actual Doctor Who comes back uh, and the big press launches that will happen at the end of this month and mm. the beginning of the next um, uh, as we prepare for Doctor Who returning. For instance, with uh, and, and finally, this this is the big news of 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 the week. This happened yesterday as we record this on Friday. Uh, is that uh, Varada Sethu is indeed uh, has been announced as a new, a new companion uh, for season two. Um, they re- even released a couple photos as if to say that, uh, you know, Shudi Gatwa with Millie Gibson and Verada Sethu, uh, one with <laughs> Shudi Gatwa looking at Millie and another one looking at, and they're all having fun. They're not picking favorites. That was uh, even, unfortunately our first thought. It's like, oh, the the, the internet myth making machine is going to start like, making some myths about this. That's yeah, right. like these, you these know, ships are navigating as we speak. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'm just sort of say which yeah. one are they? Like, are going back yeah. and forth? Is it that one? Is it that one? Or is it that's the one right there? Probably is that the <laughs> distracted boyfriend meme that, is what I, what I thought. thought but I do. I that's what I thought. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, and the, you know they, um, the, the two companions for season two. Uh, take that for what you will. I'll, I'll talk about maybe a little bit what have I heard, but what which uh, one is Nissa and which one is Tegan? Yeah, well, it has uh, to go back for no yeah. good reason. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, uh, as we know, I mean, it's uh, we 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 had kind of had to talk about the fact that she was seen on set like several weeks ago mm-hmm. shooting scenes for episode two. It's like in public. Um, you know, and it's like, okay, this is uh, the new companion, but the BBC isn't announcing yet. And, uh, and, uh, but now they, they finally have. So, so yeah. Any, any thoughts on the new companion that we didn't talk about already like several months ago when they were shooting this? I leave it to our guest. Yeah. It's just, Derek. It, it's just interesting. Doctor Who being shot so far in advance now, like, like insanely far in advance and these mm-hmm. things inevitably are going to happen. And it is interesting that it took them this long to have this nice tidy press release. Uh, about this and not really say much uh, about it earlier and and so it's it's almost like an era they, they just assume that it's going to get out there i suppose and and in in some way or another they're going to get spotted uh, because they're going to be doing this location shooting and unless it blows up into something else that they that they'll have to deal with they just maybe in this case they decided to just let it ride for a while until they could you know make the announcement like kind of let that let that initial thing run its course 
And then when they felt ready to make that announcement, and it's a way to kind of build into the publicity for the season that's just just about to drop and everything. Kind of mm-hmm. Just kind of bundle that in with what's happening with season one anyway. And so I think from yeah. maybe that's what they were thinking from a strategic uh, point of view. But what I worry about things being shot so far in advance, and I don't know, I haven't, you know, I don't know any rumors or speculation or whatever. But just by virtue of things being shot so far in advance. We're going to hit the end of shooting, <laughs> presumably, mm-hmm. <laughs> like a year right. and a half before that episode drops. And Much and, like Chris again, Eccleston. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so that's just going to be, I, I think it's almost inevitable uh, we might be in a situation eventually. I'm not going to say it's going to happen anytime soon, but say in a couple of years or something, where the 16th Doctor is spotted. You know, somebody spots some kind of action going on in the set they have to kind of make that announcement and we still got like a whole other season <laughs> to go yeah. of, of the 15, 15 doctors. So it's just, it's just weird. We kind of have to, you know, uh, situate ourselves to this, to this sort of era and this kind of pace of things. And it's very different than even what it was, you know, even, even a decade or so ago when there'd be sort of months separating these out, but this far out. And I don't know if that's going to continue. I don't know if that's the plan from here on out, or if this was just to kind of, for everybody's shooting schedules, just to bundle these, uh, the production as it is right now. But yeah, I, I, it's going to be difficult to avoid in, in, in future with, uh, with that big, big gap in between production and, and the airing. Mm-hmm. I was yeah. just thinking when you mentioned that about regeneration scenes and in the modern series, I can't think of one that isn't in the TARDIS or somewhere closed off that they can hide. Yeah. Yeah. As I think yeah. They, yeah, exactly. I think they, they have to do that. And I think if, if uh, particularly if they're shooting this far out and everything, mm-hmm. and it may, may even be the case, I know with the last regeneration or the, well, the one previous to this from, from Jody and David, he hadn't even cast yet, right? I mean, that, that was that yeah. they, yeah. they shot that yeah. completely months ahead, uh, which is, I think, the first time they've done that, you know, that, that far, that far out from this. And so, you know, conceivably that could happen again, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right, you're right, Warren, they've got to keep those, that's mm-hmm. the one time they try to keep it as under wraps as, as possible. Although, yeah. um, way, way back 15 years ago, they did have to, uh, I think because of a similar gap, they did have to basically announce Matt Smith um, right. a year yes, out. Yes. Mm-hmm. June 3rd, 2000, uh, January 3rd, 2009, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, a full, a, a full year minus two days to the day to his first appearance at the end of the end of time. Yeah. 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 And so they had to, uh, and that was a case of probably figured they needed to get out ahead of that and, uh, do the whole special and everything. It wasn't just a press release. They did like a whole, who's a new doctor mm-hmm. kind of thing and everything mm-hmm. about that. Capaldi, they did that too, a live spend. Was it live? Yeah, yeah it, it was, was live, yeah, it was. live August August fourth. I remember 4th, the scenes August fourth. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, which you know was only like what three, four months, five months, final math, four months, because uh, he appeared at the end of the Christmas special that year. And then the uh, video of Jodie Whittaker. So there was that too. The video of Jodie Whittaker. But yeah. like you know, I'm just trying to think. Like even like the classic series, like Colin Baker was announced in August of 1983 because it was going to be leaked. Uh, so we yep. and so basically we had all of season 21. Mm-hmm. Knowing that Peter yeah. Davison was gone, you know he's already gone. We're already watching his his last series. That guy That's, from Brothers, what? Yeah, that, yeah. that like that feels like the only classic series mm-hmm. uh, analog to what we yeah. might get eventually with with Shooty Gatwa. Although I'm struggling know. to think of non set bound regenerations there too, which makes sense given the technology you had to have at the time. Right? Yeah, in order to pull this effect off. Such yeah, as you yeah. Did. You had yeah, to do I think it they, they were all on on set. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I believe. yeah, yeah. And it's you know it's it's something that other series like I'm just thinking of like right now Star Trek Discovery is in its last season, but they shot it in like 2022. Like this is like mm-hmm. a year and a half ago that they shot this, but you know most of it's usually in studio. They don't have to worry, or they're out at some quarry or something like they were in yeah. episode three, and they don't have to worry about fans deluging uh, some <laughs> suburban Toronto uh, location for <laughs> street filming for Star Trek. I mean, Discovery. I will do this if I recognize the location. Yeah, the but Doctor Who, <laughs> like every third week, they seem to be shooting in the in yeah. Cardiff somewhere. So you, you know, it's such a you know. I wonder if Disney. I, I don't think Disney actually cares about the casting. Honestly, it's just like 
<laughs> you know, they don't they don't really know who these people are. I yeah, wonder if there's like a tie in. Yeah. yeah, because uh, Verada Sethu was in, was in Andor, and maybe there's like there's a tie in there at all. Mm. But I don't think honestly, I don't think Disney markets their shows that way. I think they're no. they're more about the uh, the actual show as opposed to who's in them. You know. Since yeah. we have Derek on, I'd like a, a segue into Trek for a second. I want to know what you think about the fact that we're gonna have. I think I did a, the math in my head. Two shows, Strange New Worlds and and whatever this Academy, new Academy, Academy thing Star is going to be. Academy. And that's it. That's all you got for Trek. So what are your thoughts as a media historian and, and analysis? And, and what yeah, analyzer? <laughs> I think we've had uh, a lot of Trek and a lot of great Trek the last several years. And uh, that's been, uh, we benefited a lot from the strategies that, that Paramount had uh, during that and, and being able to put a lot of money but not as much money as you would think honestly that was that was the interesting thing at least these shows aren't as expensive as, as you would think but anyway having a lot of that out there i think it's fair that that like discovery we could say it's, it's five years but actually in terms of of uh when it premiered to when it's ending mm -hmm. it's, it's seven years you know uh and so that, that's as, as long as a run was at least in terms of years and in, in, in the classic era i do think because of what's going on with paramount right now which is com complete chaos and uncertainty about mm -hmm. whether it's yeah. all going to be parsed up and what's going to happen with it and everything. There's a lot of, of who knows what's going to happen with that. And I think uh, the two things, I think they do want to continue Star Trek going in some form or shape. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're in a good spot right now of there being some kind of Star Trek TV thing going. Um, if it's only like one thing at a time, you know, maybe that because um, they realize they want to keep that momentum going, but it remains to be seen if we're going to have, uh, the multiple kinds of things going at once, mm -hmm. or if we're going to get, mm -hmm. say, you know, uh, another uh, animated series, you know, uh, another take on that, or a spin off to Lower Decks or something like that. Um, we've already got the one, the Section 31 thing has right. been extended as a that, standalone yeah. movie. Yeah. Uh, Starfleet Academy, um, apparently, uh, apparently, is set in the 32nd century. So it's technically like a spin off of Discovery, I guess. Mm. So okay. um, those sorts of things. So I think they're going to continue. They they want to continue the continue the the, the franchise rolling on, along on t on TV uh, in some form or another. But I think they're going to be more judicious in choosing what that what that's much like Marvel and Star Wars are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think in general, I think it's, that's a good way of thinking about that. They're just going to have mm. to kind of tap the brakes a bit and, and slow down and 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 be more strategic about. Uh, what what they're doing instead of just throwing all the spaghetti at the wall all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a bad thing because I remember what was it Picard season two kind of like a discovery was delayed in its in its broadcast and they had to like have a like a two or three week delay in the distribution of episodes and it like jammed up into Picard. So like mm -hmm. the last yeah, two yeah, episodes yeah, of discovery yeah. dropped mm -hmm. the same day as like the first two, like it was, and it was just like, what? Well, we have like two star Trek yeah. shows to watch the same. It just felt like, it's yeah, like there's too much all over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. So no, it's well, it's I think, uh, but again, I think with all these, they're they're, they're going to value them, but they just want to they just want to be strategic about that. Which just mm -hmm. to kind of pull it back to, to Doctor Who, it's interesting because mm -hmm. we've heard Russell Davies talk about wanting like the Doctor Who, you know, universe or multiverse kind of going and these various spinoffs, which we know they're coming, you know, in some form or another. We've got some coming, but it seems like it's um, it's an approach or a model from a few years ago <laughs> that they're going to yeah. pull back the mm -hmm. brakes on. And, and the whole thing with the Disney deal that, that I've, I'm, I'm, I've always been curious about is, is this something that was initiated under the previous regime, the Bob Chapek regime, that is something right. that Iger has inherited now. And mm -hmm. not that it's the top of his, of his docket by any stretch, you know, it's way down the list, but still it's one of those things where, okay, I guess we've got this deal that we're going to do and we're going to honor and we're going to carry that through. If it works out well, if the if the show and the spinoffs do really well internationally for Disney Plus, I think that's that's fantastic. If they don't, then I would imagine at some point there's going to be renegotiation of of what the scope of it's going to be and, mm -hmm. and how often and and those, and those sorts of things. Just because we're in a period of, of contracting, you know, even even popular IP being contracted into mm -hmm. you know more things that they they can get the biggest bang out of the buck for. Mm -hmm. The great thing about that is as classic Who fans, it doesn't matter how cheap it looks. <laughs> we'll yeah. be fine with whatever they give us. <laughs> Keep it so, yeah, yeah. I, it is. I mean, I, 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 I like to 
plan out uh, this podcast as far in advance as possible. And I was sort of looking, looking. So we got like, you know, Doctor Who coming in May and then a Christmas special and then another season in May. And just based on when they were like starting to shoot based on that production website, you know, in March, they started production, maybe not actual filming, but certainly pre, you know, actual production of, of the Sea Devil spinoff, the five part spinoff. And I was thinking like, when would that be broadcast? And at this rate, probably maybe I was thinking fall of 2025 is my mm. guess just because of when Doctor Who's going to air. You don't want to have it like, here's Doctor Who ending in next week. Yeah. Here's mm -hmm. that. You kind of want to have it as a bit of a stopgap in between the actual seasons of Doctor Who. And I think if you do like two seasons worth, you know, basically 13 episodes of Doctor Who content a year, that being a season of eight episodes, a Christmas special, and then a four or five episode spinoff, which is what the Sea Devils is. I think that's just about where mm -hmm. you want to be when it comes mm -hmm. to making, you know, not diluting the brand, so to speak. You know, I don't know mm -hmm. if you have thoughts on that, but. Yeah, I think so. And I think that that gives, that gives uh, some breathing room that, that gives them some time, a runway, you know, for the uh, promotion and stuff uh, that, yeah, I, I agree. I think it, it's good to, to not dilute it because it was that exhaustion that, that set in, you know, when uh, in 2021, 22 for all those Marvel series on, mm -hmm. on Disney, mm -hmm. which would, it seemed like it was, it was a lot, but it was like, like here's some ice cream, here's some more ice cream, here's some more ice cream, you know? <laughs> yeah. or, yeah, and that's wait, why wait, it had nothing wait. to do with eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going, give me exactly. some ice cream. Oh, not that much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's, uh, I think the wiser strategy and you see this, uh, discussed these days a lot with the studios is they keep they're talking about ip they're talking about familiar ip and when they want to invest in that and that's fine but they also know they need some new things they need to kind of reinvest in those kinds of things and i think we all want to see that we all want to see what else what else you got you know and, and i think mm -hmm. in terms of uh in terms of doctor who if it comes to that you know that sort of level that's that's pretty good if we if we get eight or nine episodes of doctor who and four or five episodes of a spinoff every year that, that's pretty solid. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that I think, I think that would be, that'd be a pretty good, good arrangement, you know, going forward yeah. on there. So, yeah. Cause it mm -hmm. gives the, the core mothership show. And then we've got some, uh, interesting, you know, other side avenues that they want to explore. And, and maybe there's some other opportunities to develop new writers and, and, and new sorts of things along those lines. And, and, uh, yeah, I think it could be really interesting. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't oversaturate it. We're not getting just over exhausted by it. Yeah. Uh, and it's all on, uh, Disney plus, um, you know, this is the main reason I wanted to have you on Derek to, to sort of catch up on, on the streaming option of uh, the fact that, you know, the, the, the dropping at midnight, which of course has got the, uh, the people mm -hmm. in the UK all, uh, <laughs> all head up because they have to stay up till midnight now to watch. Doctor Who, uh, when the option was to go and just watch it on BBC One as per normal, but of course you'd be spoiled if you were online or something like that, or just the idea of knowing that you're no longer the first person to watch this this episode. Other <laughs> so people will be. have seen it. You actually could be the first person. Yeah, if you but the time I, yeah, I know, but you know, it's it, uh, I mean, it's it's slightly different in the states, but not really. It's um uh, in that I remember we were talking about I think when you were on before Derek about how like the average age of the of the BBC viewer on TV, terrestrial television is like 60 years old. There was a recent report about like the average age of an NSNBC viewer is like 71 years Which, old. Uh, I would have thought it would have trended younger because they're more, it's a way more liberal yeah. channel, but no, apparently not. Like it, it, you know, I, I feel like finally the BBC is sort of saying, you know what, we need to target our actual proper, uh, target audience with this and go to where, how they're watching these things. And that's watching mm -hmm. it on streaming and they want to, and not waiting for five forty five on yeah. a Saturday night, you know? Yeah. And I think it, it, it is something that for the traditionalists and, and for the, uh, the people that are, are used to things dropping for the first time on, uh, on terrestrial TV, it's going to be a big adjustment, but I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, they want to go where, where the audience wants to see it. And, uh, they're going to be, scrutinizing those numbers very very closely i would imagine to see how that spikes up on mm -hmm. um so it'll drop on iplayer right like at midnight uh I so, yeah. midnight yeah, yeah UK I play time, midnight yep. on, on saturdays and there'll be a fair amount of people that do that and then a fair amount of people throughout the day on on saturday that do that and there'll be some people that watch it saturday night and so i mm -hmm. think it's going to be an interesting uh addition to the ratings 
because uh, prior to this, you know, they would have the terrestrial broadcast and then whatever sort of tales from that in terms of on iPlayer or whatever. But now they've got this, well, what happened before the terrestrial broadcast and mm-hmm. in those, you know, 12 hours or whatever before that, uh, that they can do. So, um, yeah, I think it's, they're going to be looking at that carefully. And the demographics, as you say, are going to be really critical with that as well. And that's how people want to see that. Yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm curious, you know, I always wonder like where, how much of this was the BBC's input or like what did, you know, where the, did, where did the Disney and BBC meet in the middle when it came mm-hmm. to how they want to distribute this? If they're you even know. talking to each other. Oh, well, they're talking. I, I feel like this is definitely a Disney initiative in, in wanting it to drop. I feel like the, yeah. the specials dropping at, at, at whenever that was broadcast, I think was kind of like, mm-hmm. uh, okay, yeah, we'll enough. let you do that. But once we're actually paying for the series, which is what well, I'm led to believe is actually happening mm-hmm. with, with episode one, there's no Disney money in the, in the specials. Uh, I feel like they had a, a much bigger say, and this is we're dropping. You know, the, I bet you Disney was probably saying, you know, you, Saturdays really okay. You know, I bet you Disney <laughs> probably wanted to drop it like on a Wednesday or something like that. Yeah. But Saturday was probably the concession to the BBC. I don't know what, what do you have thoughts on that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think I think that sounds pretty plausible. I have no we have, we have no no idea what uh, what actually happened. That that uh, mm-hmm. that sounds pretty plausible. That this is the BBC. And maybe even RTD himself was just like, no, Saturday, that's, it's a Saturday show. This is kind of what we do and everything. And, and Disney's like, all right, well, this is what that's going to entail. And if this is a condition, you know, for that, you're going to have to give up having it first and then going out. So, um, yeah, in this way, everybody gets it at once, right? And so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this is, uh, that's the thing for Disney. I mean, you're right. I think, I think they would probably prefer like a Wednesday or Thursday, but maybe they're moving even away from that being that concerned about when things are going to drop as well. So Mm -hmm. the other thing we got to remember is that, yeah, we're going to watch it as soon as it drops and people in England are going to watch, but we're a small group. Most people aren't going to get around to it. Saturday. No, right. That's, that's the main audience is people are like, Oh yeah, that's on. And they see the daily. I mean, I do it all the time with stuff I care less about. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's gonna, yeah, it'll be, uh, just like anything else in streaming in that regard, right? You know, people mm-hmm. just jump on it that, that weekend and other people that are vaguely interested will eventually, you know, get mm-hmm. to it and everything. I'm going to be very curious to see how prominent it pops up. I mean, it's got the landing page of Disney now and those sorts of things, but is it going to be, you know, put up there when it drops, is it going to be put up there, you know, you know, new season now premiered or whatever, mm-hmm. Doctor Who, when you, when you load Disney plus, it's going to be in that carousel of things that are right there. Yeah. Um, I would imagine it would. I mean, I would imagine at least initially they are going to push it pretty hard mm-hmm. uh, to do that and try to get some mileage out of that. But uh, but yeah, you're right. Most of the audience is just going to, as it is with you know a lot of these things, just kind of percolate in later mm-hmm. when they fill it in. And I think in Doctor Who's case, it is going to be that perpetual thing we always talk about whenever there's a new Doctor in in general, and, and I think increasingly over the last decade or so have had these, these big gaps in this, Mm -hmm. it's gotta be bringing people back to doctor who is part of the, part of the, uh, the thinking on this. And I think there's probably people, um, outside of the UK, uh, in particular that may, may not have even seen these, these specials. They may know, you know, that, Oh, she got was a doctor that David Tennant came back for a little bit, but they may Mm -hmm. not even know, you know, when it's coming back or how it's coming back and everything. So I think there's going to be a bit of that kind of snowball, effect that they're really hoping for they're really kind of hoping to build up as a season rolls out if it becomes this thing um which is again why i'm glad they're doing a rollout uh instead of a full drop you know i think that's yeah. really critical oh so they god can, i yeah. I, yeah i mean yeah it keeps it in the conversation i think even yeah. netflix is starting to learn about that too they're they're you know they're they drops like they're the crown dropped in two halves stranger yeah. things dropped in two halves i feel like they're they're big shows are still like yeah. amazon kinda, still hasn't learned and uh, amazon yeah. still just drops every well Follow they did, just came uh, out it's all 10 episodes i'll yeah. get to them when i get to them but uh, yeah yeah, they they did Rings of Power one one at a time. That's true. Uh, they did. Yeah. Um, and maybe a couple of other shows too. But um, yeah, I it's also intriguing. Um, but we should mention you mentioned there there Derek that uh, because they they were like the the Doctor Who collection right now can on Disney Plus uh, consists of the four specials. They're still numbered special one two mm-hmm. three four. If you do a search for Doctor Who, I imagine this will this won't be as uh, labor intensive as uh, as it is now. 
But if you do a search for Doctor Who, you can see the trailer, and that's the landing page for actual season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says it says coming May tenth. Uh, there's Judy got one and Millie Gibson on there. So sir, if you're on Disney Plus, search for Doctor Who, and you will see the trailer or something or the landing page, and and bookmark that because I think some people were thinking turned on Disney Plus at like you know three minutes to to broadcast time and not knowing where it was because it didn't show up as part of a series. Mm-hmm. Well, now yeah, it is. I'm guilty I'm, of that too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. expecting that to maybe be rolled in once the actual show is properly launched. But for right now, it's just the trailer mm. on there if you do a search. So yeah, they'll make I it would easier imagine... for you as the show shows <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would even I would even venture that maybe what they might end up doing is is keep keep the specials separate from the season until mm. the season's done, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then fold them all in together, and then we might see a slight. Um, a bit of sleight of hand so that the church on Ruby road is season one, episode one, you know, they could, they could yeah. rebrand that. And then the, the three specials prior to that would be kind of in their own bubble. But, mm-hmm. but I think you're right. I think for now they want to, they want to put all the attention on the episodes that are to come. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's where they want to draw people's attention to. It's, it's an interesting metadata and architecture. <laughs> I know with that, there's so. got to be, there has probably been a lot of research and like, when do people watch episodes and like, you know, I bet you that probably the BBC did too. They're probably thinking how many people are actually are going to watch it right on broadcast yeah. compared to iPlayer. And what if we just, you know, mm-hmm. made it easier for us and just yeah. drop it. You know, there's so much internal stats, so to speak, uh, yeah. at play here. But, and part of it too, I, I wonder, um, because I know the deal with with uh, with Max for um, the previous seasons of the modern mm. series, I know that that has another year to go. I think through next May or so. Right. What happens to them after that? And that's because if if Disney's like this is season one of Doctor Who, and then next year be season two of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. If if they acquire, and I don't even know if they will. If they acquire I don't know. the rights to monitor, what do they call that? How are they going to bundle that? They sure, they, they're on Amazon. I don't know if that's the same in the states. Yeah, no, it's still on. It's still on Max. Uh, okay. Everything's still on Max and, yeah. and the yeah. modern series. The two, uh, so the the Who point oh, I keep trying to call it that, trying to get it to stick, but uh, it's not happening. But uh, nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Derek. Thank you for uh, speaking I up. And, that. And, yeah, the, I'll take that. Who, who point oh, um, in Canada, uh, series one through ten, so up mm-hmm. up to but not including Jody are on Prime, but but Bell Media slash Crave still has the rights to the Jody era, but doesn't show it. Yeah, and so, they also used to have yeah. the rights to Star Trek, so that used to be the place you went for Star Trek and yeah. Doctor Who, and not anymore. They don't anymore, so I feel like yeah. it's yeah, it's it's a bit of a confusing situation. As the time goes on, I, I'm I'm less and less confident that Disney is actually going to want to yeah. buy the rights. I still to the think I, I still think what's going to happen with that at some point, relatively soon, in mm-hmm. the next say couple of years or so, is uh, what they did with the classic series, which is just basically make a fast channel mm-hmm. out of that. Mm. And distribute that, and yeah, that it seems surprise a, me actually. Seems like a no brainer at this point because then you're dealing with with a show that is effectively done. You know, you've got um, 17 years of it, and you can just keep streaming that on its own sort of standalone thing. And that way, you can distribute that very widely. You know, mm-hmm. uh, across the planet on there, and it won't live under any one particular you know mm-hmm. uh, kind of exclusivity. Like classic so, what? Pluto, Brit Box. A couple other ones, Dumplex. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, in classic in Tubi. You know, you got them on yeah. demand on yeah. Tubi and everything, right? So there's a lot of places it shows up, uh, and so I think something kind of like that, which will be, you know, it, it'll be a kind of a change of awareness because it'll be like this is this is now a legacy program. Honestly, mm-hmm. we, we probably yeah. need to think I love of it, it that way. I love just yeah. calling up any old you know, whatever they're showing of classic. Who it's it, uh, it's living the dream, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, I would love that. I mean, I, I, we can do that now because oh look, it's a curse of Peladon, or it's, you know, it's Horns of Nine, or whatever. I would love right. to get to that. It's like oh look, it's Gridlock, or mm-hmm. that'd be great. Or the, the yeah, you're right. I can't see why not to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's that's the next step, and and it, it just there's shows of that vintage that are already doing that. You know, that are mm-hmm. out there uh, streaming. So I think it's. I, w- I would imagine that's probably somewhere again in the in the cards, and uh, once once these rights deals have, have, have uh, expired in the next year or so, it's probably mm-hmm. the next mm-hmm. move with that. So, and, and that yeah. would be fine. So, mm-hmm. timing, you know, timing around the fact that you know we they've dropped the Shooty Gatwa first season, so that's now firmly this is current Doctor Who. They don't have to worry about mm-hmm. like having another previous Doctor Who sort of you know yeah 
hog the spotlight or, or confuse new viewers as such. Well, you know? and I've got a friend who'd never seen Doctor Who and he asked me what I should watch. Yeah. And I told him, wait until shooty season and then just start watch with that. Thing. And then if yeah. you like that, go find the rest. But if you don't, just watch that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I mean, that, that, that reminds me too. I think it's interesting that some of the stuff that in the specials that mm. we're, we're kind of looking backward in a way, it was interesting that I think in retrospect, we'll see that. And maybe once we get into this season, we'll really see that, that the specials seem to be a little bit about coming to terms with trauma. You know, we saw that in the giggle and everything, these references to flux and all this kind of stuff that went on. Mm. I think we may be done with that. Mm. Um, I yeah. think hopefully we're done with that. And then we start again with the church on Ruby road and going forward, that's its own story. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, inevitably they're going to bring back, you know, Daleks or, you know, the master or whatever, inevitably in there. And that's when you can kind of tie those things in. But I think, I think wisely, they're going to try to really not have to rely on telling the story about what happened and, mm-hmm. you know, in, in 2013 or whatever. And, and bring yeah. It in, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it also it, um BBC also dropped a on on i i player on BBC One or something. Uh, there's a quick little ten second teaser uh, that's just shots of of Shudi Gawa as Doctor mm. Who, um, and I, I thought it was interesting the the differences between how Disney is marketing the show and how the BBC is marketing the show. Like the two trailers we sort of watched, we can compare like you know one week apart. And the BBC one is very like doctor and companion focused. Mm-hmm. Here are these characters, whereas Disney is like, here is the show in general. And by mm-hmm. the way, there's this person at the center of it. But I felt like the approaches are are very different, you know, to how like Disney wants to get you excited about the show in general, mm-hmm. not necessarily about who is at the center well, of the show. It makes sense. It's not a cultural touchstone for us like it is for the no. Brits, right? They're yeah. going to know who Doctor Who is, even if you don't care. You're going to know who Doctor Who is over in this in, in England. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a huge part of that and everything. And, and, uh, wait, there was shades of the, um, of the 2005 trailer, you know, in, in some of the ways it's being launched, you know, it was giving yeah. some of those, those kind of when, uh, or they, they did it more than once. It wasn't just in 2005, but in, in the early years when they would have like these, uh, bits of the trailer that were made for the trailer, you know, where the Especially doctor's shot. speaking to the camera and, and mm-hmm. everything yeah. like that. And, and, and that's exciting. That's sort of like it's it's a new kind of thing that they wanted to introduce it, <laughs> yeah. introduce the show. And as you said, in the, in the British context, this is the Doctor, and we're going to really highlight. You know, you know who you know mm-hmm. who Doctor Who is. You know the TARDIS and everything. This is the Doctor now, mm-hmm. yeah. focusing on that. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it, it, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be fascinating. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, what the, what the press launches uh, do. Uh, and, and what they focus on and how exciting things will be. I imagine in, you know, it'll be all over in the UK, obviously, but you know, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of Disney owned TV stations and such like ABC and, uh, and everything with that maybe Doctor Who will sort of work in like, you know, ESPN, uh, covers, uh, playoff hockey. What, are there going to be ads during for Doctor Who during uh, the, the Stanley Cup playoffs, which start in late April, early May. Uh, Although it's going to be heard fascinating to see. Derek's expertise comes in again. I've heard that ABC might be a thing they might want to just kind of shove off in the corner. I want the Disney. Well, yeah. I, well, I don't know. But before you jump into it, I just, because when they announced the day, uh, the day after Jody Whitaker regenerated, uh, they announced that Disney Plus is on there. And where, you know, Shudi Gatwa was on um, <laughs> whatever Regis and Kathy Lee is. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. how it was on an ABC morning show uh, yeah, yeah. Fair uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to talk about it. Uh, the fact that he was in New York to do that. So, you know, maybe they, maybe they're actually going to work in their terrestrial. Yeah. I just mean, long term Disney yeah. might oh, want to get yeah, yeah. ABC and I, I well, wouldn't be surprised. Won't. It's a money printing machine. Yeah. 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 I, I wouldn't be surprised at, at this point, at least because they still have that. If we see another round of that, mm. if we, you know, maybe see, uh, I could see like Shudi Gatwa being on the Jimmy Kimmel show, let's say mm-hmm. the week it launches, I think would be appropriate, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that would give it, that would give it enough of the kind of, you know, lift that, that it would need and everything that, that they would want to do if they want to kind of uh, go that route to promote it and everything. I'll be very interested to see where the ads kind of turn up in places yeah. too, you know, on, on these, on these big broadcasts and everything. And, and uh, and see, cause that, that'll, that'll show they're kind of, kind of serious about giving it that push and then using, Using ABC and the other on the other outlets for what they can for that for promotion and, and everything. Um, I'll also be curious to see whether uh, the TV critics, such as they are right now, kind of come to this and talk about the show. And because uh, I think that was really instrumental 
in the tenant and, and Smith years, I think in, in getting the show part of like, not only a fan conversation, mm-hmm. but like a general television conversation mm-hmm. for a while in there, which it really hasn't been uh, in, in the, in the U S at least you know, since then. So I think this is a, a good opportunity since sex education was one of those shows that was talked about a lot in this regard, that there's that right. connection there and they can, you know, segue into that. So I'm, I'm optimistic um, that it's going to do that. I'm, I'm just going to be very curious if it does, you know, we'll know by the middle of the summer, you know, if it's had any kind of impact in, in this way or not in this regard, if, if it just is kind of came and went, or if it becomes this big phenomenon again, uh, we'll know mm-hmm. by the middle of the summer. Kind of exciting in a way. Yeah. Kind of exciting. Very exciting. Um, Let's talk. Well, uh, uh, we we just segue a little bit, uh, just because um, it, it's also part of the promotion. Even though Empire Magazine is in the UK, that they, they recently had a bit of a Doctor Who preview, uh, and an issue that is mostly focused on the acolyte, the upcoming Star Wars Excellent. Series. podcast. By the way, I can't recommend their podcast enough. It's very mm-hmm. funny. They're oh, very Empire amazing. Podcast, and they right. know their stuff when it comes to film. Uh, mm-hmm. Do they really? Well, that's oh, great. Yes. Um, they also that. talk about Spinal Tap 2 in there. I didn't realize that. I want to, They're shooting that in New Orleans right now. Um, big fan of Spinal Tap. But uh, yeah, it was, um, they, they, it was a bit of a preview and stuff. Um, is there anything... I, I want to do a bit of a, of a... Maybe even a mea culpa, but a bit of a deep dive. Is there anything from the, <laughs> the Empire Magazine thing you want to talk about before I, before I get into this? Either of you? The fact that maybe Maestro was uh, mentioned as the name of Jinx Monsoon's character in episode yeah. two, The Devil's Chord? That's the one, that's the one thing in there that, and that again, that's going to... It seems like... It'd be, Possibly salient, <laughs> possibly interesting, uh, right. in there. That that's a, that's a new bit of information. Yeah, I don't think it's the master. I don't think no, so I, either. I, I think, think it's so I think either. it's just a, it's a red herring. I think it's just a mm-hmm. way to kind of get people oh, about this. But I yeah. think it's more toy makery stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maestro conductory, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing, which is yeah. very much what Jinx uh, is doing in that episode. Um, yeah. It, on, on okay, here it is though. So so in <laughs> in in the magazine, <laughs> uh, they had uh, on the YouTube version. Of, I'll, I'm showing a couple of pictures. There's, there's Shudi Gatwa sitting on on the same set by the looks of it, um, uh, trying to strum guitar. I wonder if Shudi Gatwa actually plays guitar. Judge by the way he's holding it, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but you never know. Uh, and then and there's another shot, a, a crucial shot uh, here of <laughs> of the Beatles in in studio there. So uh, the listeners of this podcast have known that I, I looked at the. Uh, the drum set, uh, and have complained of the fact that, that Ringo did not have, uh, that kind of drum set. Uh, he Very had the Ludwig, the Key. Ludwig, uh, mother of pearl kit from 63 onwards. Um, but I, I look at other uh, stuff in this, the, the image that we're looking at is, is, uh, the Beatles basically standing, uh, there performing. Uh, it, I'm still upset that John is playing an acoustic guitar with a full electric band. <laughs> uh, and the thing is not mic'd. Um, and there's Could no separation. Rehearsal, you don't know. Well, yeah, maybe it is. There's no separation involved at all. Um, uh, but the, like the the stands, like the the mic stands, uh, are all very accurate vintage. Mm. Um, I did I did some searching around for Beatles in the studio in '63 and '64, and uh, the, the shot I'm showing now is one of them in '63. You can see Ringo there actually playing a his premiere kit. That he had up until 1963, and the microphones. I don't know if you if you could want to compare the microphone right to uh, next of uh, George there, um, is is of the exact same vintage as yeah. being used in here. The haircuts are entirely different. See, the haircuts are more 1965 Beatles, yep. and uh, compared to their their 63, <laughs> and indeed, so this. So now I'm showing a where's 1965. The, where's the culpa in all this? Well, uh, what as I'm looking at this now, th- I'm showing a, a, an image of them in. 1964, when uh, Paul still hadn't quite got the mop top that uh, that he uh, they they've sort of portrayed in the other ones. Everyone's on electric guitars, but um, you know the image that that I, I'm sharing from 1963 is them clearly posing with them, maybe rehearsing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Even though in the Doctor Who episode, they're they're clearly recording for some reason. Even though John, although I look at that now, and I feel like is there like a cable? Uh, leading to an imaginary uh, acoustic pickup, which I don't think they even had in 1963. Yeah, that doesn't sound accurate. Tra- trailing mm-hmm. down his, his leg there or anything like that. Um, 
And I'm wondering if if actually the the Beatles episode happens like you know maybe Jinx Monsoon comes and like evaporates the Beatles early on in the episode, and therefore we have no Beatles because this is kind of what they're alluding to in the Empire Magazine thing, is that the lack of Beatles is what is what propels this episode. So Which is maybe That's yeah, the take. the mm-hmm. inaccurate drum set and everything else is actually. <laughs> Because well, maybe people didn't care. Well, no, P- certainly I, I have it on good authority that Russell T. T. Davies does not care about people like me when it comes to <laughs> to to, to, uh, to talking about the accuracy of the drum sets. But I'm now now having seen these photos and and sort of knowing reading the Empire magazine thing, I'm thinking that maybe the Beatles are basically. Um, uh, wiped out of existence at the beginning of this episode, and 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 it's up to to Doctor Who to come in to the 1960s and says, where are the Beatles? They should be here. And then that's why, because Jinx Monsoon has evaporated them out of existence before they even became a thing. Oh, this I'll is my s- prediction and perhaps hmm. why there are inaccuracies <laughs> in I'll say from, from the two seconds of moving footage that I've seen and I'll three images again. I've Being seen. Being a computer nerd in the 90s and watching any portrayal of computers right? in the 90s was a way bigger nightmare than this. Uh-huh. The net as my one and of many pieces of evidence. Good point. Well, I just, I just love the level of detail in that analysis, though. That was that was that was beautiful. Oh That's well, and, and, you uh, know, in the episode itself, it's going to like transpire in like in like in, it's it's, it's going to be the pre-titles. Open, like Forty-five it's seconds be, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, going to be, be over. Yep, it's going to be over before we even know it. And I'll, uh, but I'll, but but it'll be episode. Listen, that's going to be a busy weekend because we're going to have to review two episodes in this podcast, and I'm going to have to zapruder that first 18 <laughs> seconds of <laughs> have to is doing a lot of, of, work of episode two. Of it's going to be, be a great full because breakdown. of the you know they're they're not paying for any any Beatles songs in there. You know, no. I could see it being the, in the cold open like. Ringo like starts to count it off one, two, three, and then <laughs> yeah, two. yeah, and then something that sounds vaguely yeah. familiar to yeah. the Beatles, like a twang yeah. from the early, yeah, years. or they play skiffle songs, they could play skiffle songs, that's those true, were, presumably yeah. they're covers, right? So, yeah, yeah. like the opening chord of help. It says, No, you can't even yep. play that yep. chord, you can't even play that <laughs> a chord that's Beatles copyright. Yep. Opening chord to help. Well, I like yeah. the fact that this also implies that the Beatles said, "Ah, no, not a way, not a chance in hell." Like the remaining but Paul, basically, and yeah. Beatles yeah. said, "Yeah, no, no, not yeah, yeah, yeah. not even for Doctor Who, not even for Doctor Who in the BBC, nope, not even for Doctor Who." <laughs> Head, I mean, full props to uh, um, the Prisoner uh, because the Beatles were a fan of the Prisoner, the yeah. show, and they allowed them to have "All You Need Is Love" playing mm-hmm. throughout that last episode Fallout. That it's still incredible. there. How you, that you, amazing. Yeah. Which you is go a on to Tubi. That year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That year. It came out that year. And it's on The Prisoner. And if you go, you go watch it. The Prisoner's like oh, on Tubi so or other I places. Love the prisoner so much. And there's a Beatles song on there. And it's just like. And it's amazing. incongruous because that's The Prisoner. Yeah. Yeah. Beat the Prisoner's so great. Anyway, yeah. um, I just wanted to point that out uh, that I'm willing, I'm now willing to be proven wrong. <laughs> wow. When it comes How gracious to, of you. <laughs> Yeah, I I will yeah. like I will accept. <laughs> I will, I will, you are okay, Doctor Who production team. Whew, what a judging. What a I know they were yeah. really worried about that. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm still were. a little concerned about the about the acoustic guitar being performed in a live situation <laughs> like that. The, that episode will just get yanked from the air on summer ceremoniously. We've made these yeah. egregious errors. We must apologize. This That's, this is big vague YouTuber esque <laughs> apology video yeah, from Russell true. D Davies, and you're like, yeah. what is he apologizing for again? What? <laughs> I know. I will be taking many shots of me doing various reactions and going ah, angry at uh, right. what, just what we set. need. We, we do have a, a That's even before we get to like, you know, the, the music theory nerds going off on, on, on whatever's oh. gonna happen, you know, with, with Maestro's oh. powers or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, what she does. Which I which I hope they take they, they do a little deep dive into, you know, some actual valid nerdery to be able to do that. But uh you know, that's we'll true. Take there. I, I love the liberties with that man. essential uh, thesis of uh, this fictional series is not hewing to reality. Well, I, <laughs> That's I, kind of how they work. I know. Well, <laughs> also sure the, the fact that this uh, they've sort of stated like there's some more fantastical elements coming into Doctor Who now yeah. because of what the Doctor did at the end of the universe uh, with. Um, Wild Blue Yonder, and mm-hmm. then the giggle, and all this sort of happening, and then they, maybe this is kind of like a bit of a hand wavy, and they can sort of like, oh well, it's just the the fantastical yep. nature of the universe that there there's an extra chord now, you know, you can play an H chord for some reason. Well, like, H that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, well, I, magic. I'm not, I'm not sure why these hand waves bug me as 
much. They don't really bug me that much, but they bug me more than previous hand waves, which was just as hand wavy do. I'm yeah. not sure why. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's because of RTDs utter and complete self-confidence in them. Maybe that's what bugs me about it more <laughs> than the actual things themselves. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like Stephen Moffat was like neurotic enough that he felt mm -hmm. he had to sort of like close the loop on some yeah. of these. And I, feel, I kind of felt like that's right. He'll he'll explain this. He'll put the toys in the back of the box and we'll be fine with it later on. But and yeah. Archie yeah. blew it wide open and said, ah, I'm not explaining a damn thing. Yeah. 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 But there's always yeah. been hand waving. I mean, that, that's the beauty of Doctor mm -hmm. Who and everything. Right? That's with, true. With all of it's this. true. Yeah. So it's just, it's it's our burden. We're trying to piece it all together at the other mm -hmm. end of it, you know, to to account for it. So, burden, yeah. I mean, disease. Yeah, <laughs> frankly, yeah. Disease, yeah. disease, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What I'm more intrigued about, um, uh -huh. to, to keep on with these, these these episodes, I'm really curious that these first two episodes are going to be bundled, which to me is a way of potentially. Uh, softening the blow of space babies <laughs> a little bit mm. so that we go right into the next one because people are going to be watching the two and presumably if they're doing are they dropping the first two episodes but they have to be i guess on, on the bbc as well they are uh, yeah. to do that and so that's what i kind of wonder about this is if we're all going to be talking about the second episode because that's the yeah. one we're going to we're going to see and have at freshest on this and maybe not as much about the first episode which might be good for all we it might be yeah i'm i'm, I'm always very, very, very afraid of, of, of digitally altered baby mouths and things mm, like true. that. Yeah. Kind of yeah. out, but <laughs> right. I'm not a big fan of that. But we'll see what, what it all entails, you know, again, and just like, yeah, whatever whatever they want to throw at us for that. But mm. yeah, it yeah. Is, it's, it's interesting whenever there's like two episodes, particularly in a show like Doctor Who, which isn't like serialized and everything. Yeah. That. It's, it's, it's like these are two distinct stories and we're going to go right from one to the next one on there and, and we're going to have to go back to the first one. So oh, yeah, that was what happened in this one. And Although so, with streaming, yeah. you could start with the second one. I know. I just think <laughs> of that. Like or you just could just watch them in within a week of each other. You don't have to true. do it. Yeah. You can also it's just true, skip yeah. ahead. How does episode two end? Let's find out. And you just yeah, skip well, you could, ahead. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> just, why would yes, you do you that? Yeah. 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 yeah, it. Uh, I, I also wonder if that's a Disney thing, you know, like, yeah, we usually like to drop the first two episodes, BBC, so is that going to be a problem for you because that's what we're going to do? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, I mean, right. they're just two episodes. They're not, as you say, Derek, they're not probably going to tie into each other apart from maybe some connective tissue at the end of one into two. But, uh, yeah. you know, they don't feel like they're part of the same story when you look at the what they are yeah. space babies in the devil's cord and mm -hmm. they're entirely yeah. different things but very different yeah so oh, it's, well. it's 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 gonna be interesting in that way all right well let's go for this one and then yeah next episode yeah we will see uh, for those uh, that care about such things, uh, the Radio Times put up their top 100 uh, of TV list, and uh, and Shooty Gatwa, Millie Gibson, Russell T Davies are all in it. Uh, in, I think Shooty Gatwa was the number one in mm. this uh, mm. historically curated list uh, that is very important. <laughs> He's now oh, down yeah. to number five, apparently. Um, right in between, um, uh, Bella Ramsey from Last of Us fame and, okay. uh, and Game of Thrones and, uh, and Sally Wainwright who, uh, did, uh, what, um, Call the Midwife, I think? No, Happy Valley. Uh, Happy Valley. Know. Happy Valley. Yeah. Um, Millie Gibson, I think is what, 14 as I'm scrolling through the list here and, uh, right, right ahead of David Tennant. And then Russell G. Davies is, is, uh, 27, just ahead, just, just behind Lenny Rush who appears in Doctor Who and uh, ahead of Lee Mack and Vinette Robinson, who are both in the um, uh, Chris Chibnall era of Doctor hmm. Who. Is and Thomas Brody Sangster. Actually, everyone on this list, the top 100, <laughs> was or will be in uh, in or involved in Doctor Who. At, is this a top 100 of the year or of all time? Because It's, it's the year. Because, yeah, year. it seems pretty topical. Of who's going to be yeah. like... Uh, yeah, the number one uh, is... Um, uh, a BBC thing called Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, the ensemble cast of this thing, mm. this unsuspecting hit on BBC One that apparently a lot of people have watched. It was going to be this little thing and then became just this huge hit that I only heard about when I think Variety posted an article saying this huge hit, unexpected hit. Is, is, that, is that the thing that presaged the something. scandal that happened in real life or is that something different? Because you turn on BBC and you're like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. This news that everybody seems to know what they're talking about. Warren, I don't know. Okay, well, never mind. I think then. it's it's based on something that actually happened. So it's, yeah. it's a true, yeah. it's an adaptation of a, oh. of a true mm. true story. So yeah, but post offices starring Toby yeah. Jones, who of course was in Doctor Who, and yeah. Indiana Jones, and Dollar Destiny. I was too. That's right, and literally everything else. Toby Jones mm -hmm. is, well, is yeah. in yep. everything. Um, 
The uh, here's something. Um, so we've been waiting for for news of when the uh, Celestial Toymaker animated version was going to be released. Uh, I uh, we had it on pre order here in North America for May fourteenth. Uh, I didn't even have a release date in the UK. It is now coming out this more or less the same day, June tenth in the UK, June eleventh in uh, in North America. Um, the, they even released the the cover, the Blu ray cover with the uh, the spooky looking uh, CG toy maker and. And very, uh, very much a stage kind of reminds me, actually, of the um, the toy maker stage in oh, yeah. the Giggle. Oddly enough, uh, mm-hmm. I wonder if there was a tie in there at all. But uh, but yeah, coming out June tenth and eleventh, uh, you can I think it's available for, for pre order in the UK now as well. Um, everyone loves the animation style and there has no uh, controversial <laughs> opinions <laughs> about it. All. Opinions on the internet? What? None, oh. none whatsoever. So. Looking forward to seeing that. I'm also looking forward to seeing why they waited so long and why it's coming out the exact same weekend. Uh, I think we ascribe we... meaning to things that are just chaotic yeah. nonsense yeah. most I of the time. So I think much, so too. Yeah. I think the, the thing is just ready to go and so let's just put it out there. That's why they're mm-hmm. doing it. That's why they're doing it. Um, also coming up, uh, available for pre-order, a book I have been looking forward to a long time, the Doctor Who read. Production <laughs> Diary, the Hartnell Years, will be available soon from uh, Telus Publishing. Uh, it's available for pre-order. This has been many, many months and years in the making. It's basically a day-to-day diary of the making of Doctor Who. This is the type of book, Warren, that is 100% up my alley. Oh, yeah, but you still won't read it. No, and no, there's it's nothing not... wrong with buying and letting it sit there. Like, right. there's, somebody's getting that's paid totally if you fine. do that, so that's good. Like, keep it up. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a type of thing that, oh, what happened today in history, you know? Like, and just look, I suppose look, that's look true at this, you know, that, that sort of thing. Like, oh, look at this. William Russell's agent uh, tried to uh, get a, you know, 10 shillings and sixpence raise for his uh, his client <laughs> or something on this day in 1965. And, and a pudding, uh, a pudding of some sort. Give him a, a pudding. pudding. Oh, come on. Right? That's exactly what I'm looking for right. in a book. All right, so, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So David Brent is uh, is working on that, and he's also working on on books all throughout. I imagine just the classic series. Although honestly, the production diaries of the modern series are becoming more interesting to me because I feel like we don't have like the minutia mm-hmm. of yeah. modern Who that we do when it comes to some classic Who stuff. I'm like I don't know how they actually what when did they shoot? What was the actual production code of uh, of Gridlock or you know Vincent and the well, Doctor? Part, These part are things that I want to know. We've gotten to the point with classic Who where it's all we got left is a minutia. <laughs> so that's why they're mm-hmm. deep mining for that. We're diving that's too far true. and too deep as the dwarves once did. <laughs> so, and so we haven't gotten quite to that point yet. We're still, uh, I don't know, a lesser mithril portions of yeah. just to strain this <laughs> all past, all, all, past all credulity. Yeah. <laughs> right. To begin with. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 But no, I think, I think there's, I agree though. I think there's still a lot of uh, interesting things in the modern series. Interesting sort of moments and, and, mm-hmm. and parts of that that would have been really. I'm I'm interested to, to see just to dig yeah. into you know when, I mean obviously the production of that first season, uh, <laughs> you know 2004 2005 what all yeah. went down we'll never know I mean we'll mm-hmm. never know exactly but um, uh, decisions about when doctors were, were leaving and, and and things like that and the whole I would love to to know all the um, changes to the the flux season basically you know when oh. when covid hit and what the what mm-hmm. the plans for that season were and then yeah. how they had to be adjusted and everything along the way i would love to know what they had in mind initially and how they had to completely throw that out and mm-hmm. start over and, and and that thing so yeah i think there's there's lots of interesting things to to be told about that i'm That's following um um james curry smith's um psychic paper newsletter oh, highly recommended yeah yeah which has really been fantastic for those sorts of things. He had one on, on uh, Trial of the Time Lord season, a series on that, and uh, just that, yeah, just the, the realization, and you know this as long time ago, we know this, but just the realization that in the end of November 1986, mm-hmm. there was no doctor, there was no script editor, there were no stories, and uh, there was a producer who didn't want to be producing the show, and, and, yep. and less than nine months later, there was a new season of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the madness, just, utter madness. It, it's in, it's yeah, just incredible. It's insane. But there's just all these sorts of accounts of that in there. Um, the one he did on season fifteen, that the few did on that, are really really fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to that season Blu-ray set just to kind of 
dig into, you know, when the Hinchcliffe era became the Williams era and yeah. the kind of friction that entailed and everything is really fascinating. Mm-hmm. So. That one's been on my inbox uh, because uh, A, I, I, I want to devote proper time to read them because they're so good. And B, yeah. I kind of, I am also kind of waiting for the Blu-ray to come out. So it's kind of like more in my personal zeitgeist a little bit so I could read mm-hmm. that and then immediately watch the Blu-ray. It's coming out in July here is why I mentioned that UK yeah. listeners. Um yeah, James Curry Smith, Psychic Paper. Seek it out. Seek it out. On how much uh, is it per month? I honestly don't know. I uh, I subscribed so long ago, like probably what seven. Yeah. I don't know, seven bucks a year. I think, yeah, oh, I think that's it's that's a bargain. Yeah. Thirty bucks a year, thirty forty bucks oh, a year, something like that. So, so worth yeah. it. It's so yeah, worth it's really it. Yeah. Good. He's one of my favorite writers of Doctor Who stuff. His book, his uh, Black Archive books, uh, also very good on mm. Ultimate Foe and uh, The Massacre. And I think he's written a couple other ones that I can't mm-hmm. think about right now. But yeah, he's uh, yeah. very good stuff. So great. Um, hey, here's hey, want to talk. Hey, let's talk about missing episodes. Everyone loves Yay. missing episodes, <laughs> uh, and they're coming back officially confirmed here on Radio Free Scar. An oh, hour yeah. into this episode, <laughs> which means it's not happening. Um, but uh, film is fabulous. We talked to. Um, uh, Tim Burroughs a few months ago there's a big uh, film collectors convention happening in uh, last year and uh, and part of that initiative was to uh, kind of test the waters of, of, a, of a pilot study of of properly storing and archiving and and uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for sort of like <laughs> taking down information. Mm-hmm. about film and film collectors. Anyway, uh, just this past week, they took their first collection of 600 film cans from uh, either one person or several people's uh, private collection to be chronicled and, oh, and, uh, pornography. Stop and everything this. like that. <laughs> we're showing, we're showing uh, images of those uh, film cans uh, being stored on shelves. They'll be looked at, um, critiqued uh, for, for quality, you know, just determine what's on them. So a lot of these film cans are like basically blank. And so they're going to be determining this. So, uh, yeah, very, very interesting work, uh, being done. I wonder if there's going to be any missing television in there. Uh, Hopefully not just Dr. Who, but, uh, but stuff like yeah. that. But yeah, Derek, you, you had some interesting, uh, comments and thoughts about this perhaps. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's, it's a good way to kind of coax these sorts of things out. Um, I think it's a good timing. A lot of these collectors are, are getting pretty old and, I think it's it's a good way of, of kind of intervening in some ways of being almost a public mm-hmm. service sort of thing of, of like, we want to help you make sense of this and we want to help you find this out. And I like that they're going to do triage on these, on these films. They're going to clean them up. Uh, they're going to uh, find as much information as they can. And then they're going to enter, enter the data, as you said, get the metadata in on there. Mm-hmm. And so I would imagine absolutely they're going to find things that uh, are rare whether or not there's any doctor in there who knows i mean i guess we'll, we'll see but and how many people want to want to participate in it so i hope it's i hope it's successful i hope they're able to convince people to do this and and that they're really taking care of everybody's films and uh and not just taking them but but basically we want to you know protect uh everybody's ownership of, of these films and everything. Because the thing to keep in mind too, because we, when we talk about missing episodes, we always, sometimes we forget about this. And this is the same with any kind of film that's out there. The provenance, the ownership of these prints is just a complete, mm-hmm. you know, gray mess, basically. It, it doesn't really, mm-hmm. there's no way to kind of pin those down and everything. And so it's, uh, they possess it and they're, therefore they own it. So basically they're, they're the owners of these films and, and, and that's, that's how it's going to be. But hopefully if they're finding things, that are particularly rare. Hopefully, then then they can start the next level of discussion about, hey, can we we'll restore this? Can we borrow this? Can we strike a new print off this or scan mm-hmm. it? Whatever they need to do, and and to bring some of these things back. So, yeah, I hope this is uh, this pulls in all sorts of interesting stuff that might be out there. Yeah, I feel like the people who are gonna um, agree to have their collections scrutinized like this are ones that aren't aren't hoarders. Basically, I think they're ones yeah. that have the collection and just don't have the ability or time or whatever to chronicle it. And uh, oh, they inherited it or something, yeah. or they inherited yeah. it, and they're not concerned about it as much as like, oh, I, I want to be the one person who has this missing film or something like that. I don't think they'd be the ones offering it up in the first place. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So be interesting to see what they have to say about that. It, it, you in, in the private Slack, Derek, you also shared a, the thing from the New York Times about, uh, about audio. Um, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Miss, uh, I, I, I didn't, I mean, I guess that's the thing too about uh, yeah. missing master tapes and everything. I was shocked at the, um, 
uh, my eyes lit up because I'm, you know, a classic rock fan and like the, the Olympic Studios in, in, in London just in 1987, just saying all the, all the multi-track masters of the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin albums that were recorded, they had just tossed them in a dumpster. Just tossed them out, yeah. <laughs> insane. Absolutely insane. People found them. People found yeah. them, thankfully. <laughs> Dump, dumpster divers found them. Uh, and this is why you have some of these, uh, you know, isolated track stuff that you find on the internet. They just dumped it. They're just like, my God. 87, just, some of the best, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it's just really interesting because I think it just shows how things over time are valued very differently, right? And so at mm -hmm. the time, they were just valuing the album masters, right? So, they, well, we recorded the album, it's done. This is what we have and everything. And so anything that was left, you know, was, was basically, you know, essentially disposable or, or maybe you might, you know, if you're lucky, it was, it was kept around. And that's what a lot of it is. And then it was only, as the article pointed out, it was only in the 80s and 90s when they started doing these box sets that, and remastered yeah. editions and this kind of stuff. And they're like, where are the, you know, multi-session <laughs> or the multi-track sessions and everything. And that's when they discovered so much stuff was missing, but, but it's very similar. And reading that article is very similar to the Dr. E missing episode stories of yeah. like, yeah, they found, uh, you know, all, in all these sessions, like in, in garages in downtown LA and stuff and just mm -hmm. you know, behind oil cans and whatever. And, <laughs> in wow. people's basements and like, yeah, just it's a similar thing. So I'm glad to see that going on in, in music as well. It's like they can hunt, hunt things down and, and it's not even things that are that old. In some cases, these are like even things from the nineties that, that, uh, you know, were recorded then. Um, there was one example in that, in that article about, um, buddy holiday sessions from the fifties that luckily somebody had backed up on DAT. And so they mm. had those. They didn't have the oh, originals wow. that had gone, but they had the DAT recordings. And so right. the DAT is, is an outdated format now, but at least they had those before right. they lost the original ones. So, yeah, all these these kinds of things are important. You know, you just um, – so I'm glad that there's efforts out there to try to, to find them and, and pull them in and, and uh, you know, put them back into, into the archives and into circulation. Mm. And I bet you, like in as, as media consolidation and uh, and tax write offs continue, I and mean, there's a lot of like you know ephemera and and media in our modern age, as you know, like like the bat, like the Catwoman Batgirl mm -hmm. back movie, right? Uh, that Batgirl, yeah, yeah, yeah. Batgirl that was made and will never be seen. And there's yep. only one copy of, so they say. But you I eventually, the thing is, everything's digital now. It is easier to yeah. archive stuff. And I suppose it is, but even then, like, files get deleted or files are like wiped off the internet or something. Yeah. Like there's, you know, like when yeah. Sports Illustrated's entire uh, arc, like, you know, as like magazines will get cut yeah, well, like yeah. I'll wipe yeah. it from there because we don't have to pay the, the uh, writers any residuals. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like. I'm not defending the corporations here. I'm just saying mm. industrious individuals will make, the, the video game space is, perfect for this there's lots of people who try to historically preserve video games by yeah. pirating them because you, there's no choice in the matter there's, yeah. there's no other way to get these games yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. that's what you have to do and it's just going to be a constant sort of battle with that yeah yeah and it's um and that's why piracy quote unquote you know i just encourage fans just to, to hold on to things if they mm -hmm. can if they, if they if you love something hold on to it and figure out how to how to preserve it and, and keep that going because you're right mm -hmm. the companies they might not always have the best interest they might not care yeah, yeah. It might and be so against right. their financial it's, interest to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's the thing with, I mean, the Batgirl film, the the Coyote, the Acme. Right. Man, I yeah, am, yeah, yeah. I would love to see that, and everybody who's seen it says it's amazing. But but and they said they were going to distribute it, and then they decided not to, and it's like ah, oh, <laughs> nothing ever going to yeah. come out. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. I mean, if if there's copies out there somewhere, somebody's got you know a secret cloud drive or hard drive. Mm -hmm. you know, with even a rough version of these films on there that will be in some kind of circulation, um, you know, like Todd Haynes' Superstar movie with right. <laughs> the stop motion movie from the 80s made with Barbie dolls that was or the, completely uh, undistributable at the time. But, but Carbon yeah. Fantastic circulated. Four, that circulated too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So mm -hmm. so ideally this, this stuff will get out there. But yeah, um, yeah, it's sad. Just got to hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's always gonna, there will always be lost media, no matter what. Yeah, you know, lives I mean, I wonder about, I wonder, I wonder about all this stuff, all of the, this leading back to Doctor Who, all the stuff they did in the aughts and the teens that might not have made the DVD sets and things like this. These one-off yeah, little yeah. things like that. Then, and, and yeah. even if they were in the DVD sets, are they going to be in future sets? You know, that they're going to do, or are they just going to strip off all the little mini sodes? Mm -hmm. Matt Smith did and everything. I was like, yeah, we don't need those. Like, wait, we want to see those. Yeah. And, yeah. Like the Tardis, remember Tardis films or Series yeah. 2 that they yeah. had? Yeah. They were intended to be watched in like little, 
on your phone or something like that? I imagine yeah, people have pirated right. them, but that they I don't think they ever showed up on the Blu-ray or DVD release, I don't think. I don't remember them. I could be mistaken about this. Yeah, but. I can't so, remember if they did or not. Yeah, you're yeah. right. But there's all yeah. those little things like that that mm-hmm. you know, they just seemed kind of disposable. And obviously it's yeah. not just Doctor Who, there's all sorts of across the board, there's all sorts of mm-hmm. things like that of again, just within the last twenty years that they were doing online that nope, they're yeah. just gonna they're just gone. So mm-hmm. So if you own a Mac uh, pay the twenty dollars and get Downey, which will download anything <laughs> from anywhere. And I right. used it to back back up and quotes YouTube yeah. stuff, conferences I've gone to that I want to keep the mm-hmm. video from. Like a, it's pretty much anything it'll grab at some form or another. You might have to right. go through a bunch of weird hoops to find the M dot M three U file, but you can grab it. And so for the, yeah. for the name of preservation, please, people. And I else. know there there was a, a YouTube channel that used to have some uh, convention panels and stuff, including some of that. It was on uh, in mm-hmm. Chicago TARDIS. But I never recorded it, but uh, like I interviewed um, Premagement there and Bern Gorman. I think my first one of my first years at Chicago TARDIS, and I was going to grab them because I actually filmed them and I had them up there. And now it's gone, so I lost my yeah. chance. That's mm-hmm. what I do with some conferences. I they pay yeah. good money to see, and yeah. it's only behind a wall. I'm like, well, not for long. I'm keeping. Yeah, this. <laughs> <So> exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to name which conferences, but otherwise, I've done it. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. it's important. I mean, it just uh, in I mean, not to be sort of morbid in, in Doctor Who terms, but but again, people aren't going to be around forever and everything. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I respect being at a convention, you might be in that in that experience to see that and everything. But I would I would hope under some kind of conditions, you know, et cetera, with this, if things are recorded, uh, there's ways, you know, down the line for people to access them, so you get to see that, you know, that mm-hmm. uh, that experience of somebody being interviewed. Um, Luckily, in, in, in Hollywood, um, in the television industry in particular, they've got these amazing oral histories that, that people mm-hmm. have done uh, across the board. These are in all aspects of working in television. They've got the Television Academy in Burbank. They just have you know hundreds and hundreds of people that they've interviewed this way over the last 30 years. And that's just been an incredible sort of resource of just hearing people tell their stories and everything. And they, they knew they needed mm-hmm. to get those down and have them and, and, and accessible to people. So that's the sort of thing that, yeah, is... We don't think about that often, but it's just great to have, you know, great to mm-hmm. have that for be able to say, oh, I wonder what so-and-so thought about this at the time. Yeah. 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 Um, I mentioned Chicago TARDIS. Uh, they have announced a whole bunch of guests recently. Uh, and, and, you know, Paul McGann, Sois McCoy, uh, the cast of uh, Blake Seven, uh, Jan Chapel, uh, Sally Nevet, Brian Croucher, but also Joe Martin is coming to uh, Chicago right. TARDIS uh, November 29th to, uh, <laughs> to Warren the, uh, the, the action <laughs> dollies of the three Doctors Who that I mentioned there. Um, I've been to Chicago TARDIS since uh, before the pandemic, and, and, and then like airlines made it impossible to get there. Uh, but they, I think they've since opened up flights to uh, either Min- Minneapolis or Chicago again. So I don't know. I'm might make a return. Might make a return. Not promising anything, but I think it'd be fun to go back to uh, Chicago TARDIS. Um, uh, certainly, if they got three Doctors Who, including, yeah, including Joe nice. Martin herself, so they're they're really uh, pushing the boat out uh, for for this upcoming convention, which is kind of cool. Um, also quickly, uh, there's the new Torchwood coming, uh, the restoration of Catherine Torchwood uh, with Tom Price and Samuel Barnett uh, by James Goss coming in mm. June of 2024. A frilly garment is what that is. A frilly garment <laughs> with the Torchwood logo on it and the artwork and uh, and a Spanish conquistador in there too. So what could that mean? Looking baffled. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to uh, prepare for Christmas of 2024... Um, Hallmark has released, uh, yeah. or, uh, it's releasing a couple of, uh, <laughs> of Donna Warren's pro- <laughs> action dollies are coming in handy. You're showing yeah, the yeah, 12th sure Doctor and Cyberman. There's a 12th Doctor uh, uh, Christmas ornament as well as a Cyberman Christmas ornament as well, uh, available for pre-order starting in in July. Uh, the Capaldi one, he's doing the, the famous pose from his opening photo shoot, but I think he's wearing the outfit from, I think, uh, I don't know. The coat makes it look like it's season that's, nine, but that's my favorite yeah. Capaldi outfit. I think. It is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I love they haven't sent one. Doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. It is too. They haven't sent one, but he's doing the pose from series eight. But anyway, uh, July of um, of uh, this year is when you can start to get those in the Hallmark store or something like that. But um, uh, one last thing before we uh, say goodbye, to Derek, and bring back Chris for our commentary, which we recorded months ago. Uh, and I don't remember what we said. I just want to point out that that yesterday, uh, as we record this, April twelfth was the fifty first anniversary of uh, the most seminal 
uh, pop culture event in the 20th century. Okay, go on. And that is Stevie Wonder's appearance on Sesame right. Street. No, um, whatsoever. Uh, I watch, listen, I watch that performance uh, ever, ever, I watched it several times yesterday as recording this because um, it's a kid's show. There's Stevie Wonder in at the height of his powers uh, and he brings his full band with a horn section there. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna show the whole video here, but but it's also just a testament to um, 1970s uh, and and the complete lack of care of children in those days. <laughs> there's <It's> accurate. <laughs> there there is a kid having up, been a child in those days. There's a uh, if you watch it, I've watched it, find it so great, and it's he's just the band is killing it, right? Including a young Ray Parker Jr. By the way, of Ghostbusters oh, fame, wow. he, he just plays guitar that. on that. Uh, and there's a kid up on the railing. It's just flimsy little railing. It's about literally two stories up, and he's just rocking, back, just <laughs> bugging out to this music. He's about ten years old, and like that. No health and safety. You're gonna fall off yeah. that railing and die. No, 1973. Probably more health and safety for Grover, frankly. Yeah, oh, it's 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 the most glorious slice of uh, of. Um, of of just 1970s ephemera. Oh, There's yeah. also a behind the sheet scene shot that I'm showing with a big giant camera. Frank Oz off on the uh, on the right side yeah. there, uh, looking on as uh, as they're preparing to to shoot the performance. Um, it's uh, it's it's one of my absolute favorite things ever. We literally have a calendar event here at home. Nice. April 21st, nice. Stevie Wonder <laughs> on Sesame Street Day, uh, and I woke up and walked into the living room, and that was Erica's cue to, to hit play. Mm, on I got to watch it now. It oh does yeah, hard. it goes very hard. It it's out. it just slams it. It just yeah. So uh, links to the sh maybe uh, yeah links in the show notes. I'll post a link to it. You can you can watch and then group nice. along to one of the great moments uh, in uh, our our human history. Let's face well, I it. I can't argue with you. You are yeah. absolutely, absolutely spot on for once. Yeah. Uh, Derek, uh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to have you on the show uh, as, as a full proper guest host this time around. Is there, is there anything you want to plug? Anything you want to, mm -hmm. to let the, 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 the audience know that you're up to or, or that's, that's oh, going to be pertinent? Oh, I wish I could plug yeah. something. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I, am working on, I am working on a book. I'm working on um, uh, I'm holding down two jobs, right, two administrative jobs right now. So the book is kind of deep, deep in the back burners. But it's a, it's a book on... Uh, old media in the digital age. Uh, oh, so it nice. is all about uh, what happens to old stuff in, in the age of algorithms and and uh, digitization I mean, and everything. So, yeah, yeah, good. It will be, yeah. I will plug it when it's pluggable. <laughs> Please go ahead. Plug it away on it. So, yeah. I mean, we yell about this <laughs> yeah. all the time privately. <laughs> with yeah. yeah. So, yes. So we're definitely the audience for this. Yeah, Absolutely. as, well, thank as you. indeed, I think a few people listening to this. So, yeah, keep us posted on that, Derek. I'm very intrigued about uh, how this goes. All right. And uh, awesome. And thanks for being on. Uh, after the break, then, kids, uh, it's time to dive back into 1971 for our classic series commentary for Terror of the Autons Part 3. Are the microphones wired in? More on the condenser, most merciful. We're looking forward to excellent duodecaphonic sound. This is the moment when I get a real feeling of job satisfaction. Welcome. It's uh, the commentary portion of this podcast, Radio Free Scarrow. Classic series commentary of Terror of the Autons. That's the third time I've said Terror of the Autons, and the third time I've almost wanted to say Terror of the Zygons. I said that in my head. You're right. So you're not alone. You are not alone. Uh, Just tie in with the master. <laughs> Terror of the Autons, uh, which we'll be watching on your legally purchased Blu ray or <laughs> DVD uh, or VHS copy uh, that you might have, or black and white 16 millimeter film copy. Those are also perfectly acceptable. So, uh, For those viewmasters we got as kids, which is about uh, the same time as this era of my, Doctor Who. Pretty much. My yeah. kinescope version is, is perfectly crumbling. My kinescope yeah. version. My kinescope. <laughs> as <laughs> film nerds my, on Twitter say. Yeah, my off, uh, my off, uh, air recording from PBS, uh, KSPS circa 1987. That's what I'll be watching mine on. Uh, here we go. Uh, Terror of the Autons, episode three in three, two, one, play. Uh, one friend of mine, his last name is, well, pronounced Auton, but spelled A-U-T-O-N. Right. And okay. uh, first. Watch out around that guy. First time uh, 
first time he saw my target novelizations of uh, the Auton invasion and terror of the Autons, he got uh, quite the kick out of those. <laughs> I thought you were say offended. He got quite offended by it. Yeah, if there's like a Auten family reunion or something like that, I would just play the title sequence of this. <laughs> it just, and all you <laughs> hear during the whole thing is <laughs> as the hands yeah. open up and the gun comes out. Yeah. And everything is made of plastic. I kind of wish like, you know, Terrence Dixon archive interviews would call them Ottens, like he calls them robots, you know, like uh, hmm. Ottens. Oh, and then the Ottens invasion. What, who are the well, One thing I love about um, Rory being an Otten is right. that he's, even Otten. though he looked perfectly like a human being, he still had the crappy arm <laughs> with the hand with the terrible I know, they, vintage they looking that. gun, which is yeah. great. Not the vintage sound effect, which disappointed me. They had it in Rose. The, the sound effect was correct in Rose. Um, also... Is he still an Auton when he comes back? Because he's been around for a thousand. You're like, I don't know. Is he like? Is that timey wimey nonsense? Does the universal does he live reboot for like, make him not one? Like, yeah. How does he live for two thousand years? He's got to be an Auton, right? I always figured he got rebooted back into himself, but he remembered all the Auton stuff somehow. For all my criticism of, um, ah, yeah, look at that. Uh, for all my criticism, of RTDs. Yeah. Oh, I want to make it more fantastical. Uh, there was a lot of yeah. hand waving covered by good <laughs> wordplay that uh, Stephen Moffat did, which I was fine mm -hmm. with because he covered with good wordplay. Yeah, but then you sort of think back and go, wait a second, wait a yeah, second. Yeah, that doesn't he actually make any that? sense. And he didn't have the the charity to tell me that like RTD <laughs> is doing. Yeah. Yeah, he was on Instagram telling us those details of things. So. One thing I love about RTD is how he'll see anything on any channel that he loves and he'll just wax on about how much he loves it. Yeah. He'll just watch it. I know. And so just he's coming about it, it honestly from what I can tell. He loves TV. <laughs> loves TV. Russell the Davies. Oh, now mm -hmm. this is a sweet looking beach slash quarry. As, uh, as we record this, we're, we're done two of the three episodes of, of Nolly and have, have, now, have now seen the so-called in-universe crossover with Doctor Who. Oh, was that such I didn't a even thing? know there was one. That. No. Yeah, yeah, he announced that. Both shows feature John. Well, the giggle specifically for Doctor Who. Both, both feature John Logie Baird. Oh, Logie oh, Baird, I right? Okay. okay. I was just hoping that at one point uh, Brian Princess dropped the sonic device. <laughs> Drop it. Drop the sonic device. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, he's, uh, my case has got a fire uh, at this guy. So when I first, I mean, I still think this is. A an amazing stunt coming up here. I mean, we saw like so we had like the the Guinness Book of World Record breaking f highest free fall stunt in Inferno. Roy Scammell did that one. Terry Walsh here is about to do one, uh, which is amazing. Look at this. Look, like look <laughs> yeah, at that's it. pretty sweet. He is and that's a real like, person. They that's a all. real person there. Um, and they had two cameras shooting it, obviously, and uh, he just he just flies off. Like he basically takes a running leap, jumps <laughs> off a trampoline, and then flies down the thing, and then just crawls it back up. That's several takes later when he's like, "Oh, I think yeah. my spine is back in place." I know. God, it's an amazing. I always wanted to be a stuntman when I was a kid, <laughs> mostly because of uh, the Sarlacc pit scene in uh, Return of the Jedi. Peter Diamond does a lot of uh, who was in Doctor Who. Does a whole bunch of great stunt falls on that. And they're just like, what if I was a stunt man? Wouldn't that be amazing? And then so watching stunts like that hooked me on John Pertwee Doctor Who. I hated gym class, so there's no way I was going to be a stunt man. Yeah, I, did, I just fell off things. You can see me. You can well, you see had to me obsess various... about Doctor Who. <laughs> oh, you, you could see me uh, do stunt rolls downhills in, in many fan films when I was a teenager, kids. Of your own creation. Of my own creation, yep. <laughs> Loved rolling down hills. I have to cue that up. Oh, this drives me crazy. To close the TARDIS door. Anybody can he get in there. He doesn't what have to. doesn't have to. I'm going to wander in. Not here. They tell him not to. There's no access from the spiral staircase. Yeah, exactly. See, the Brigadier's not going in there. He's not going to go in like there for another two years. Mm -hmm. I do like that he's still a bit of a jerk to the Brigadier. I do kind of appreciate this... Uh, Haughty alien nonsense? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes, they, you know, because he, he's annoyed because they're just, you know, they're doing it, they're approaching it militarily, and that's just completely not And he's annoyed he he's stuck to here, too. That, too. That, too. Oh, good. They raided the circus, finally. It was yeah. too woke. We had to get rid mm. of it. Oh, so I guess that's it for the circus, then. I forget uh, what happens to the circus after this, but... Okay, yeah, that's it for the circus. All right, we've seen all of. I guess it wasn't the greatest all show in the galaxy after all. Wah -ha! 
Brig. Doctor, in a few short decades, you're going to be sitting on top of that TARDIS having ice cream with Yaz. That's true. And the Brigadier is going to be a Cyberman. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> you had to spoil it, didn't you? Thanks. Well. Yep. Again, another thing that I... Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> Stephen Moffat, I'm not too fond of that <laughs> choice. There's a... yeah, but then you can modify Cyber Break to dispense the ice cream. I mean, I have a cyber That's break. <laughs> so, like, he just jets up, That's spits right. ice cream out of his mouth. They put a cone up to it. <laughs> ice cream fountain, soft serve ice cream fountain machine in the shape. Of and she goes, thank you, Brig. And he goes, five rounds, rabbit. And Brig goes off. <laughs> Would you like Rocky Road? <laughs> five rounds, just five bloops of ice cream come out of his mouth. <laughs> just blop, 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 blop. Oh, mouth. Uh, oh, that's the wrong place. Uh, Why you got to ruin everything, Chris? Why? That's, that's what I signed up for. Don't ruin no, our cyber break ice cream, cream machine. machine. Don't, that. don't ruin your cyber break ice cream yeah, dispenser. Yeah, it was on. nice and innocent and lovely, and he was helping out Yaz and the doctor, <laughs> and, and then you had to ruin it with your innuendos. Innuendo? Mm. <laughs> that's <laughs> terrible. Innuendo. You should be ashamed of yourself, if you aren't already, which you mm. aren't. So... Insinuendo is one of my favorite invented words that Don Logan says in uh, Sexy Beast. Um, and disappointment's still my favorite. Disappointment's a good one, too. I just, just it just Sexy encompasses Beast. everything about Doctor Who fandom. And disappointment. It it's it a does. perfect let's, encapsulation of it. Let's face it, a lot of fandom more in these days. I mean, yeah, but the only uh, one I care about is Doctor oh, Who fandom. So. Oh, that's good. As you should. This is the second time he's done this. What's the point of being grown up by... Oh, never mind. Uh, ha -ha. Oh, there you go. There's, yeah. the, there's the origin. Of halfway it. there. We're well, halfway there. I'm just trying to think. Uh, I know Terrence Dix wrote the script for Robot, but did Robert Holmes script edit that scene and remembered this scene when he was writing it? Or vice versa, did Terrence Dix write this line about what's wrong with being childish? I like being childish. Yeah, maybe, yeah. And include it in Robot. Somewhere along the line, somebody wrote... Probably the same line. Oh, that's not going to go well. Well, yeah. daffodils. Daffodils. Uh, what's the charity here in Canada? I'm probably uh, cancer. Everywhere. I think, isn't it? Is it cancer? I know that they would they would hand out plat. Uh, plat not didn't quite look like I that. Think it is. Oh pins. my god, this guy still creeps me out. These guys are creepy. This is uh, like who would? Oh wow, yeah, I love daffodils. Creepy, strange cloud guy. Of course, we'll, well take that like, off your hands. It's like whenever you see, hey, I want to see. Uh, haunted evil set of toys and it's some like 1930s toys that's kind of what mm. these guys remind me of yeah well like the like the doll that john um what's his name a bbc john you mentioned him earlier chris what's his name i can't think of him john oh, um, yeah yeah skeezy joe or whatever his name is it's uh, not skeezy joe which guy three, sorry three named guy who invented john tv john what Logie was the Baird. name of the puppet um it's only from Two weeks ago, I know so. I can't remember the name of the puppet. Right, two months ago, I guess that he that he got in the in the giggle, and that's the one they use. But Stucky Bill, that's and what, yeah. like that's like we think it's the creepiest looking doll. That's what all dolls were like, and kids loved them. And it's well, yeah, yeah. You look back at anything from like I don't know sixteen hundred, seventeen hundreds, or whatever, like yeah. old, old 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 stuff. And there's lots of like Terrifying. creepy ass dolls well, and, and weird the weird thing is i thought all stuff was crappier back in the old days because when right. i go to a museum here you'd see the crappy stuff then i go to england and i go to their museums and i see thousand year old gowns that look like somebody made them yesterday and you're like mm. oh no no we just got mm. the crap in canada that's all yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah all the paupers got the uh mm -hmm. the awful crap and all the stuff that we made like, for the, the rich mm. people you know in the british this... museum they had automatons from the 1600s like little you know dancing and they were incredibly intricate they were amazing right just to bring it back around, uh, Jonathan Colton wrote a song called Creepy Dolls. Yeah, I'm sure he There we go. Doll. There we go. Probably <clears> something <throat> on his sci fi. Did people cruise. squee about it? Probably. Probably. My dear girl. I remember being annoyed when the doctor always called me Dear Joe. And I thought, what are you calling me my Dear Joe for as a kid? Therefore, I didn't quite cotton on to Pertwee until later. Don't know why that annoyed me, Ooh, that exact phrase. Is it but... The cheeky oh. look. Here we go. Here's a here's our first. Is this our first proper man from the ministry? No, is, we've had. He, he's those the some high ass trousers. I was going to say, look, look, the, exactly how good the master is wearing a suit. This guy is the balance <laughs> of the force. <laughs> that totally blows up. Because look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, no. even I know this guy has got it oh, all wrong. Oh, he's just like wow. Look at that. 
Like that's a cartoon like, walking around. What is he this? looks like? I'm just a I'm just a humble southern lawyer kind of uh, suit. That's what <laughs> he's totally got going does. on there. But even I know this is a crime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And I, I do love the way that the do- this is kind of cool. I do like the doctor like leaps in to defend the brigadier here because it's the man for the ministry. He has his pecking order. Oh man, look at this! Just lays into him. old Tommy Roland. <laughs> Lord Rollins. Oh. I love that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this wrong sort of chap is creeping into your lot. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And of course he's like being so sweet and nice. And this is why, you know. This is feel, this is I, the origin yeah. of Canadian passive aggressiveness. Is right yeah. We get it from the Brits. Oh, man. That's true. I do feel like they should have cut back to Pertwee earlier on that one and then linger on this guy's reaction. But uh, who am I to tell Barry Letts how to direct? (laughs) Sometimes I am telling Barry Letts how to direct. And his name is Brown Rose. That was not a joke. No. no. I think that's a... Robert Holmes is like, yep, let's uh, (laughs) change one letter in his name. Yeah, exactly. He's already already angry at the government as Robert Holmes. What I love about the four by three um, aspect ratio them. is that right. everybody has to close talk by an out of necessity, and it's just so creepy. Oh, especially in uh, Graham Harper uh, directed stuff from the 80s. It's just like, have, have these two people just kissed? Like, I just feel like that's is, uh, we've just caught them in a moment here. Now, what's the actress's name again? I was going to look up her age. Oh, uh, uh, pseudo Jean Stapleton here. Uh, mm-hmm. Barbara Leek, L E A K E, is her name. Um, I remember that. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, 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 she's probably in like three episodes of Zed Cars from around Born in 1903. Time. Okay. So she is in her like- Oh, her, she's like in her late 60s. Okay. Late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Like just about 70 by this time. Yeah. Born in 19, just how old British TV is. This, this, uh, she was, she was 15 at the end of World War One. just so you know. <laughs> wow. Doctor, you know, I know. I mean, anybody who's a Gen Z or listening to us was probably thinking the same thing. You were alive in the 70s? Yeah, I know. We were alive. We Listen, listen, kids. We remember 9-11. 9-11? What was that? Oh, well. <laughs> well. Yes, and rotary phones. Oh, the pandemic? What's the pandemic? What are you talking Well, that's... I was meaning. hanging out with my millennial friends, and uh, and we were talking about the first historical thing they remembered, and I was like, it came to me, and I'm like, oh, shut up in advance. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember... President Carter signing a peace thing with uh, Anwar Sadat and Menachem yep. Begin on the White House along 1978, I think it was. Nine, nine, like 79? Can't Somewhere around records? there, yeah. yeah. And this is like long before they were born. They were all born in 1990, right? So. What do they know? They don't know what the Challenger was or what Duck and Cover was or Chernobyl but, or anything. But the youngest guy was like 22. He was, uh, oh, I'm only, 9-11's my first. And he said, both of us are getting discriminated against right now. I'm like, you're right. right. <laughs> For the exact mm-hmm. same reason. So we bonded over that. Nice. She doesn't seem too broken up here. Well, her husband did seem like a newspaper reading jerk. I know. Well, you know what? I've watched more than a few episodes of Midsummer Murders, and every every spouse uh, who they interview about their their dead spouse, five minutes after the fact, says, "Well, let's sit. Yeah, sure, I'll sit down. Have a have a good, lovely chat. Do you want a mug of tea? My husband has just been murdered. However, I'm not going to let it spoil this cup of tea. Well, this is this is kind of the whole thing about episodic TV. Like it always bugged me on Star Trek that. And Picard's two-parter about getting tortured, which the name of which escapes me. Chain of command. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he it's pretty brutal, <laughs> like right. especially for the time. The next week they're off on riser, so who knows where? And just a doop de doop de doop. Nothing. Oh, happened. I know. Uh, the they one... do go into it a little bit more, like later on, but that well, that was the... a rarity that that happened. Well, I remember the one where Worf uh, gets paralyzed, and. Because he's a Klingon, he thinks, oh, I am not worthy of living. And so he wants to like commit like ritual suicide. Mm -hmm. And his son there is Alexander. Uh, And he's like, you know, talks him out of it and stuff. And at the very end of that episode, he's like learning to walk again, like in physiotherapy. Like he's barely managing it. And then he's fine the next week. The next week, he's just back up and running and off we go. Let's let's go on a away mission with Worf. Speaking of Alexander, I don't remember this is D Space Nine or TNG, but there's one where Alexander is the ultimate fail son. He just cannot be a good Klingon. It's DS9. I, He's I DSN don't remember what happens to him after that. Is he just he just kind of fails? Like I don't remember. I don't remember what happened. I know I know that one of the actors who played uh, his son is dead. No, that's too died, bad. died young. Yeah. 
just just to bring it right down. Because I know Chris likes to talk about dead people, so uh, in that podcast, well, it's either that or we want to pry this plastic thing open in a horrific way. That's true. I I do. I mean, I know they're doing it to like get away from like cutting up open this prop and everything like Mm -hmm. that. But it it almost feels like there. This is too gruesome. Yeah, it's kind of clinical. It's it's kind of like when you watch a horror movie and they don't show you anything, and so your brain is doing all the work. Yeah, which is the best uh, horror movies do that. But he even says it's solid plastic. Uh. But yeah, you're yeah, I right. bet you Mary Whitehouse is right off screen with a switchblade, <laughs> <laughs> just with with a little little note going. Solid okay, plastic. Oh, oh, you're lucky you zoomed in there, Barry Letts, because I would have had words for you. Good thing he didn't hold his under his head under the lake and drown him. <laughs> Barry Letts is like, one day I'm going to hold a guy under the lake and drown him. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Take that, Mary Whitehouse. Yeah, it has on his desk. Dear, you know, dear Philip Hinchcliffe, here are some of the things I was not able to complete during my time on Doctor Who. Number one, hold Doctor Who's head under the lake and drown him. Do that, please. I'm just looking at these phones and I'm thinking to myself, it's a very much a writer's stereotype to get a typewriter, an analog typewriter, because they look cool. Yeah, and they do. you can do. use yeah. them too. Yep. But I want to get one of those phones. Is it called a trim phone? Is that what they're called? I don't know. I'm going to find out. I don't. I thought they were called trim phones. I never. I remember keep say, uh, seeing people refer to them in uh, in um, write ups and stuff. That's a trim phone, and I don't think we had that model of phone here in North America. But trim line phones for sale. Trim line phone, or is it just trim phone? Uh, these look like regular old, well, regular to me because I'm old phones. Right. They don't look like that specific kind of BBC <clears throat> phone. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate. I know that uh, we had, well, our, we were different because we had a, a novelty phone when I was a kid. It was one of those, it was a new phone, but it was like ones where you held the receiver up in here. And my parents thought it would be fun for our secondary phone. And it was for 10 minutes. And it was, yeah, it was rotary and everything. I thought, oh, At least it wasn't fun. a football, a Sports Illustrated football. It was not, no, it was not a football phone or anything like that. That is, uh, you know what? That'd be tough to do as a, a person playing an auton, putting a mask over another mask and getting it mm, right. That's so true. For him. Oh, I'm having bad chemistry class flashbacks. Bunsen burners. Uh, Making remember, free with this Bunsen burner. That sounds filthy. I remember Bunsen burners. We used to heat up mm-hmm. chemistry. Is this were used in chemistry class? Is that what they use yep. these for? Yeah. I don't think I used any after junior high, but... No, maybe high school. I can't remember. Yeah. No, no, I must have done in high school. I don't remember high school anymore. I don't. I didn't remember it at the time either. That's why I did so badly at it. But uh, oh, got a flash of some CSO coming up there. Hmm. Boy, My phone quest is not going very well. Oh, for, what, oh, were you looking for Trimline phone or? Um... Well, Trimline's an actual brand, and it's like the. If you'd know, recognize the minute you saw it. It's not oh, okay. Screw up. Because this, this is a trim looking phone here. I yeah. mean, you could carry one of these around in your pocket is what. Uh... <laughs> if you had an extraordinarily large pocket. Yeah. You know, if you had a big long flex and stuff, but you probably don't. Oh my God. Oh my God. You you just missed uh, Joe getting attacked with a... Uh, by a doll, aka a doll being thrown. I love that uh, Yates uh, has a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shoot that doll apart. Nice work. We Somebody had to wire up that doll with explosives to get that to happen. That's they the best literally part. did. It's literally a guy pulling off bits of pre-cut yeah. uh, auton or auton, if uh, referring to Chris's. Uh, He's got three friend. phones. My God, what an age yeah. we live in. Three phones. Daffodils. I thought the breeder is getting a stick out to beat him over the head. <laughs> okay, <laughs> finally my chance. Bam! <laughs> Take a daffodil. Wouldn't want to face the Germans without this. That's a black. This is basically reference. Magneto, except in plastic form. Plasnito, if you will. Remind me what Magneto does. Magnetic powers. He's an X man. Is he an X man? So anything He's... metal like this, for instance, he could manipulate. Right. He is played by uh, Gandalf actor Ian McKellen. Yes, of the Snowmen fame and nothing else. That's right. He was appeared in Lord of the Rings, uh, that, and uh, and I guess an X Man film. I'm kind of shocked Ian McKellen's never been in a Star Trek, unless he has. 
No, God, no. Why would he do that? British actors don't usually show up in Star Trek films. Or let's put it this great. way. I, I'm mildly surprised he never showed up in a Harry Potter movie. But then again, That's since he too, already yeah. did Lord of the Rings and it was about the same time, it's probably mm-hmm. thought that I don't need to sully my reputation. Was he, was he asked to play Dumbledore? He I feels like a natural for Dumbledore, doesn't he? He yeah. does. I think he was asked. I can't remember for sure if it was either. Either he was asked to play Dumbledore outright or... He was asked to play Dumbledore when Richard Harris died. And I can't remember which one it was. I would guess the latter. Michael Michael Gambon took over. (laughs) Yeah. I love this autopsy in the safe, by the way. (laughs) He's just hiding there. What's he doing? Like, uh, you, hide in the safe. Someone might come back. Okay. Okay. (laughs) It's like he's been there for like four weeks or something like that. (laughs) Just like, just ready. Perks of not having to breathe, I suppose. Uh, I guess so. The thing about... Ian yeah. McCullough's Dumbledore is, do we say that because he was Gandalf? If he'd never been Gandalf, would we say that? <sighs> I yeah. think he might have been asked regardless. Yeah, I mean, he yeah. is of the right vintage and quality level to be that role, yeah. right? So. I had, I would think he would have to, t- if he was offered it outright from the beginning, he'd probably have to turn it down because that was around the same time they're making Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And he was yeah. going to be in New Zealand for three years. And we were better for it, so. frankly, in a million different ways. <laughs> Such a good, so good movies. I haven't watched those every every Christmas. Though yeah, it was, comes around, and I think oh, this is the time I'm going to watch them again. And I never do. Never do. At least play the Lego video game. I, I like that they're great. old enough now that there's a meme where it's 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 the uh, it's a thing from um, Malcolm the Middle where the kid says he wants to do something the dad loves. So they zoom in on Brian Cranston, and then the lights go down, and he's just overjoyed. And it's basically, <laughs> Dad, I want to watch Lord of the Rings, and it just zooms in on Brian Cranston, and he's like. <laughs> So he, he was asked to take over from Richard Harris when Richard Harris died, except okay. Richard Harris apparently made some disparaging remarks about McKellen's acting ability. And so McKellen <laughs> said, that was Richard Harris, no. that. Yeah. Wow. Whatever cake in the rain, ba- pal. It is the same guy, isn't it? I had to try that song. MacArthur Park, same guy, Richard yes, Harris. It is. MacArthur Park, yes. that, someone left the cake on the rain. It's a Richard Harris made, jam. Man, that's right. <laughs> what is he doing here? Dave what is Thomas that, on, a joint? What is going on? Made famous by Dave Thomas on SCTV. SCTV, that's probably where I knew of it, yeah. I don't think I've ever listened to this. Oh, there's a cliffhanger, by the way, we just talked over. Um, mm-hmm. Watch out for corded phones, everyone. That's why they got rid of them, because of this episode of Doctor Who. There's a movie, and I can't remember the name of it, with Chris O'Donnell in it, where they the star of the movie, it's a mountaineering family, and uh-huh. they are debating someone left the cake out in the rain. Audience, tell me what the hell movie this is, because I've long since forgotten. <laughs> Chris O'Donnell. It wasn't O'Donnell. very good. Well, it might be Canadian. Not very good. Chris O'Donnell, that might be Canadian Yeah, right it's there, and it's so. in the late 90s, somewhere in there. I was yeah. going to say it's Cliffhanger, but it's not Vertical Limit? I, they, they might be right oh, about that. Oh, my God. Do you know this, Chris, uh, or are you just looking Directed by Martin Campbell, written by Robert yeah. King, starring yeah, yeah, Chris yeah, O'Donnell, yeah. This Bill sounds Paxton. about right, yeah. All right. Well done, Chris. Well done. Robin I mean, Tunney. <laughs> like, well done. Robin Tunney, I remember. Scott Glenn. Scott I Glenn, I remember him. Scott he Glenn's was in... the dad in it, that's why. Yeah. Oh, he was in Signs of the Lambs. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. He's in Daredevil. <clears throat> is he now? Yep. He well, plays Stick, who's of... like his mentor. He's actually very oh. good in Daredevil, the original Netflix series. Wow. Hmm. Well, uh, come around on uh, part four, our final commentary episode, folks, to see what uh, what other uh, Canadian shows and movies starring Chris O'Donnell we can pull <laughs> can out. Pull out of the uh, depths of my mind. And mention. Uh, hope you join us for that and all episodes of this podcast, Radio Free Scarrow. So uh, until next time, I am Stephen in Edmonton. Morning, Vancouver. <laughs> and Chris in Edmonton. So long for now.